thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're really excited about this. I know people are going to keep filtering in, but we'll just, I'll sort of ramble a little bit to give them time to do that. Um, tell you a little bit about what's going to happen. So um, I'm Sarah Chapman, and I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Media Bar Archive, which is based in Chicago. Uh, Media Burn collects, preserves, and distributes documentary and experimental media produced by artists, activists, and community groups. Our mission is to create positive social change by amplifying underheard voices, both in contemporary dialogue and in the historical record. So this event is part of an ongoing free series called Virtual Talks with Video Activists. We've been doing them every two weeks since the start of the pandemic. Um, and um, they create conversations surrounding media production. So if you join, enjoy this event, we've got a whole slate of things coming up. Um, the next one in two weeks is a screening of Jeff Krulik's Mr. Blasey Goes to Washington. Um, you may know Jeff Krulik from Heavy Metal Parking Lot, but we're gonna do a little bit of a deeper cut with him. And then two weeks after that, a really powerful upcoming World War II documentary, a preview screening called um, I Wanted to Be a Man with a Gun. But tonight we are very excited to be presenting a screening and discussion of excerpts or a, a, a segment from one place to another, Emma Goldman Clinic Stories from 1996, and to be joined by the film's director, Leanne Erickson, who will be in conversation with feminist film scholar, Caitlin Campbell. So um, we're gonna start off pretty quickly, but I just want to remind you that um, you are absolutely welcome to ask questions either in the chat or out loud. Um, but until that time, please stay muted so that we can all hear the film and we can hear each other very clearly. Um, if you would like to use, to use the captions, there are captions. If you um, go to a little more dot, dot, dot button at the bottom of your screen and click captions, you can enable captions um, if that helps you um, understand the audio a little better. And this event is being recorded. Um, we will send you all an email with a link to the recording within um, maybe tomorrow, hopefully, if not, then on Tuesday. Um, and you'll be able to share that with um, your friends and colleagues who may, who may have missed it or if you want to rewatch, watch it. Um, yeah, so we are going to, as I said, we're going to be showing about 25 minutes or so. And then we'll um, start the discussion with Leanne and, and Caitlin. Mm -hmm. Um, so I will just briefly introduce them. Um, Leanne Erickson is a professor of film and video production at Temple University in the Department of Film and Media Arts and has been an independent video slash filmmaker for over 35 years. Her work has appeared on public and cable television, in media and art galleries, and has won national and international recognition in video slash film festivals. Her work includes documentary, experimental, and animation titles, including Top Secret Rosies, The Female Computers of World War II in 2010, Neighbor Ladies, 2005, uh, this film, um, and Mystery Dates, 1992. And the, those last three that I mentioned, you can all view on mediaburn.org. Um, Caitlin Campbell is a scholar of radical feminist history, rural queer cultures, and US land politics in the 20th century. She earned her PhD in American Studies with distinction from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill this spring, 2023. Her <laughs> Yay, congratulations. Her current <laughs> manuscript project expands upon archival work completed for her dissertation, Unsettling Women's Land, Property, Sovereignty, and Radical, the Radical Imagination of Lesbian Feminist Thought, which argues for the utility of archives of rural lesbian feminism for present day social justice movements. Caitlin is the 2016 Harry S. Truman Scholar from West Virginia and an alumna of Wellesley College. So with that, I will hand it over to Caitlin and Leanne. Um, if you want to say something before the film, you can, or we can go straight into it. Mm -hmm. uh, Caitlin, did you want to start with anything or? Yeah, I can give a brief intro and then I'll hand it over to you, Leanne. Um, it was such a pleasure to watch this film. I'm somebody who um, studies feminist movement history um, and have sort of dabbled in working with some of the film created by 70s activists, including, including Ariel Doherty, my friend who's here tonight um, and who I'm excited to have conversation with. Um, and I previously worked in reproductive justice um, sort of in a around a similar clinic in West Virginia that started around the same time. Um, but to kind of just frame this film for folks, um, the 
From one place to another, the Emma Goldman Clinic stories follows the story of the Emma Goldman Clinic, um, which is in Iowa City, Iowa. And this is a clinic that's founded by a collective of radical feminists with Marxist politics in 1973, right in that moment that's in the wake of the Roe v. Wade decision. Um, and the collective had a wide range of goals, but centrally, you know, they had a desire to make a, to offer abortion care. But they also wanted to offer a wide range of patient-centered health services. These are people who are coming out of the feminist self-help movement. Uh, and this year, the clinic celebrates its 50th anniversary, which is a really um, great time to be watching this film now, particularly also in our amongst our current climate um, around reproductive health and justice issues in the US. Yeah. Something that I really appreciate, appreciate about this film, and I'm excited to ask about in the Q&A, um, is its focus on group process, uh, both, you know, the power of group process and the conflict of group process, which are so critical to these radical feminist um, spaces and movements. Um, and I think really what this film does well is demonstrate how people are balancing um, a real dedication to theory with also the practical aspects of prax practice and praxis and how to, how to mix and blend the two. Um, but Leanne, I'll, I'll hand it over to you if you have things that you'd like for folks to know before we start watching the film. Yeah, um, yeah, you're definitely picking up on <laughs> all the various moving parts. But um, yeah, the uh, it's interesting when I first screened the film. And so this was what, 96 uh, at a few different um, uh, film centers and so on. A number of people in the audience were like, oh, I thought this was going to be about abortion. And I said, no, it's actually about these women and their process of, 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 you know, abortion is just one of the many things that services they were trying to provide, but even more so, it was absolutely a feminist exercise to, a, you know, a radical feminist exercise to them. And I mean, only young people would say, you know, screw it, we're gonna do it ourselves because, you know, there is one moment where one of the women was saying, you know, as soon as Roe v. Wade came down, they called, local University of Iowa hospital and other doctors in the city to say, okay, who's going to start doing this so we can refer people to you? And they were completely shut out. So they said, well, then we'll just do it ourselves. I mean, that's the beauty of youth, I think, that you'll just like, screw it, we'll do it ourselves, you know, and they, and they did. And it was a pretty um, difficult, challenging process. One of the things um, um, my co-director and I, Camille Seaman, we, we did a number of interviews um, because we knew it was going to be the 20th anniversary. So this was 1993. All these women were coming back to Iowa City. Camille and I were both in graduate school and um, knew the clinic well, had done clinic um, defenses against Operation Rescue and so on in 91, 92. You know, it was right around that time. It was very, quite volatile. And um, we said, we've got to get, we've got to do these interviews. We've got to get something going. But as we started looking into who the Emma Goldman Clinic really was and how it was formed, we're totally fascinated by the process. And we decided um, for those people who might be on, on listening and who are filmmakers and, and particularly documentary filmmakers, you know that sometimes a subject is part, tells you how it needs to be structured or points you in a direction. And um, certainly in this case, we made some very specific decisions to kind of um, celebrate and pay homage to the kind of politics of these women. So for instance, we um, I think interviewed 25 people and it's very common in when I do documentary, for instance, to interview 20 people and only a handful get into the actual documentary because you start to see where it goes and people start talking and finishing each other's thoughts and so on. And other people, while they might've been great interviews, don't seem to make it um, come together. Well, we made a conscious decision. Everyone will show up because they all did in fact show up, right? And um, we also made a decision not to name anybody on screen. So nobody becomes somebody you're identifying, even though there are women who are on screen more than others you'll only see them listed in the order in which they appear. So their, their names and their anonymity, it's still more of a group um, uh, kind of um, identity. So that's what we were really encouraging. We also were really struck by one of the first interviews we did where this woman was talking about that they had bought this old house and they're going to make it into a clinic and they'd have these long and very long hours upon hours um, consensus um, directed 
meetings in the kitchen where women would have their feet in the sink and they're arguing politics and so on. That really came alive to us. Uh, this idea of cooking up revolution in a kitchen in this old house um, really appealed to us. So we decided to, to um, set all the interviews in kitchens. So there are certain things that are happening, the, the parts, the opening with that black and white storyteller who remains consistent, bringing us from you know uh, her own experience through her illegal abortion to the work she did with Emma Goldman Clinic. So the structure um, and probably every detail in this film was thought out from a political um, sensibility influenced by these women we were interviewing and the clinic itself. So um, I just wanted to give that as a little, um, you know, structural um, tweak. And then I th we're going to watch, I think, part one, I think. And then uh, then we'll do a QA and a after. You need to bring that with you at the time of your appointment. Mm -hmm. We do not accept personal mm -hmm. checks for that service, so it will need to be in the form of a traveler's check. Or oh, do you want me to start? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Welcome to the Emma Goldman Clinic. Um, we're going to go on a tour of the clinic. I'm Gail Sand. I'm one of the directors here. Uh, I'm always happy to do tours of the clinic so that people really understand and have a sense about what feminist health care is about. I was once introduced um, at the Optimist Club uh, with the introduction that uh, the Emma Goldman Clinic is something uh, we in the community have heard the most about but understand the least of all the organizations in the community. And this is a chance for me to let you see the clinic um, in operation. The waiting room uh, here is de was developed with an eye to making uh, women and their families feel comfortable. Uh, many times the clinic has been referred to as a safe haven and we really want women the moment they enter the door to feel that they are supported and respected um, as uh, consumers of health care. Uh, we try to have a diverse uh, uh, reading materials, uh, things on the wall, our brochures, all to reflect um, welcoming to the diversity of clients that we serve. We're going to go back here. This is the nerve center of the clinic. This is where the hope for the contact is initially made. I was the uh, program coordinator for the National Organization for Women, the Cedar Rapids chapter. So I was trying to figure out programs for the different months, and I heard that there was this clinic in Iowa City and that they did a self-health exam uh, demonstration. You know, I was like, oh, that sounds fun. So um, I called, and I'm almost positive it was Gail. And arranged that she would come to one of our NOW meetings and she showed up with a woman named Shelley Womantree, another wonderful woman. Boy, that's going to get redundant probably, but anyway. Um, and here was this, you know, little group of us, little NOW women up in Cedar Rapids and here's Shelley and Gail and they do all this whole thing about our bodies, ourselves and, you know, health and, you know, taking power, control over your own health and everything, and then there they were, and they were dropped in their drawers, and they were putting in the speculum, and, you know, we were all like, ah, oh, how interesting. Well, so I, uh, so I bought my little plastic speculum, and uh, the sheet on, you know, how you use a mirror and a flashlight, <clears throat> and I went home. My mother is a nurse was a nurse. She's dead now, but my mother was a nurse, so she was real familiar with specula and all that type of thing. So I can come proudly home and I go, look, Mom, look what I bought. And she said, what are you going to do with that? You know, I'm going to do a self-exam. And she's like, oh, really? Hmm, well, okay, have fun. 
so I go into my bedroom, get this lamp, and my bedroom had hardwood floors, bed had rollers. So I, uh, you know, I get this hook, hook neck lamp and the mirror, and uh, I'm just balancing the lamp on the bed, and so I insert the speculum, and just about the time I figure out how to get the darn thing open, there, there's a raw wire on the lamp, which hits. The lamp sparks. Since the bed's on rollers and I had my feet up on the wall, I went, yikes! And the bed goes shooting across the room, and, you know, I started laughing, and my mother's in the next room, she's going, you trying that self-exam now? <laughs> it was months before I ever did that again. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> that was the very first contact I had with the Emma Goldman Clinic women. What you need to understand about Emma is that just about every woman involved in the creation of the clinic was coming from a personal space. We were founding something that was probably born out of ignorance to some extent. When you're young, you just know what's right. You know what you want to do, and you just do it. When you start a project like the Emma Goldman Clinic, it's a creative project. It's like giving birth to a child, and you have to come together as a family to do that. So, um, you know, it was the uh, coming off of the, uh, the crash of the 60s. We thought the revolution was right around the corner, and there was, you know, a lot of music and people were going we were going to rock concerts and and we had street dances and we you know the alternatives were being organized and we thought on the one hand it was just around right around the corner by 75 we were pretty convinced it wasn't going to happen that it wine if i couldn't anything cheap wine anyway. um, on january 22nd 1973 when roe happened um, i happened to be over at law school when i heard the news and it was my first instinct just to head over to the women's center where I had been meeting with these other women and we had been doing abortion referral out of that service and um, and just see if somebody else was there it was just you know kind of an instinctual thing and um, um, I'm fairly certain that both Roxy and Patty were there I know that a group of people showed up I really couldn't say everybody who was there but we were just so excited and we were you know whooping and yelling and just on January 22nd you know, 1973 when Roe happened um, and then we, you know we went wow now we don't happened. have to refer people yeah, to I New have York anymore or, or California or someplace and we can uh, uh, Iowa women no longer have to fly because we used to have to get people in and out within a day um, you know some teenager who has to lose plane to get on a plane and go to New York and have her it was really pretty tough state of mind, um, actually made phone calls that very day out of the office to some local gynecologist and said, now when are you going to start performing this service and, you know, how much will it cost and things of that nature. And they virtually hung up on us. I mean, they were just incensed that we had called and asked such questions because they had no intention of changing um, what it was they were doing. So um, that's really where the seed of the idea came from. raised in a Methodist little tiny farming community. Uh, the idea of a cervix and looking at it, whoa! <laughs> uh, but also the idea of letting a man look at that or a stranger and me not having seen it made me even angrier. The first printing sold so fast we haven't had time to revise the printed course. We are working on revisions which we hope will be ready for the third printing. 
Information is a weapon without which we cannot begin the collective struggle for control over our own bodies and lives. The Boston Women's Health Course Collective, 1972. To me that I wasn't spending some after the wolves, which was what it was like when it was illegal. That was the women's self-help movement and the new edition, but I think the first edition of Our Bodies Ourselves came out about that time. And what are our bodies? Very, First, they are uh, us. We don't inhabit them, sort of we are them. Um, women's health, reclaiming um, the, the, the body contains uh, four the major cavities. These cavities are actually so filled with organs and fluids. They should not be thought of as huge holes or hollows. And so we felt that if we, as women, whether we were feminist or not, um, it though was we were, a jubilant day. Um, we felt that if we could provide those services, it would be better yet um, than uh, a male physician, perhaps, that was shortly after out the book, to make our bodies ourselves had come out, or you know, maybe it had been 20 years after that, and the whole. The organism is composed of many systems. Systems are composed of various tissues, and tissues are composed of similar kinds of cells. We women demand birth control, not so that we can be used by men in demeaning or inhumane relationships. A liberated woman does not mean a free fuck. We had earlier that fall uh, seen Carol Downer come to town and given the slideshow with the self-cervical examination and had really opened up a whole new possibility of how healthcare could be delivered, um, patient advocacy, um, a lot of very radical issues of access to abortion at a time when abortion was not generally legalized in the country. And so, um, you know, out of those activities and that commitment that had been going on for a number of months, we just, um, we said, hey, why don't we do it ourselves? And of course we loved the idea as soon as we tried it on. And, we started meeting. January 29th, 1973. Women's Clinic Meeting Minutes. Will the clinic emphasize self-help and deprofessionalization? Yes. Need for tight, dedicated, politically agreed, responsible group. We need to hammer out our politics when the group gets going. February 12th, 1973. Abortion Clinic Meeting Minutes. Meeting once a week? Comments. More time is spent now meeting with others. People are wanting to quit due to time commitment. There's too much speculating. We need more discipline. We need an agenda and a time limit to the start of each meeting. February 19, 1973. Abortion clinic meeting minutes. Strategy. The clinic is a workable idea in Iowa City. Abortions only two days per week. Counseling on the other two days. Minutes. April 12th, 1973. Ourselves. We should describe what we want. Deb. Abortion clinic two times a week and the rest of the clinic devoted to general outpatient care. We need to be safe medically and legally. We should be working collectively and Deb doesn't think it will come off that way. Then we would start coming to meetings and I don't really recall how often we met. I know we probably met at least once a week. That would have um, been typical back then. And we would meet with the idea of, of having, of putting this thing together. But from January until around June, that's all that happened. I mean, we would meet and we would debate endlessly about politics and it was very clear that we had people in the group who were becoming exposed to feminism and uh, leftist politics and things of that nature for the very first time I certainly was among that group and then there were people who had been involved for like a year and a half and had done a lot of consciousness raising and were already you know way ahead of us in the thought process I started attending some of the meetings in the early parts of 1973 but I was also full-time in school and I couldn't take the meetings I mean it was just they were very long and of course I was like Big eyes, you know, they'd be these arguments. I'd be, whoa, okay. Deb, 
sees her role in the clinic as one who would put a lot of time and energy into the clinic to the exclusion of full-time law school. Patty, we need to begin to take definite steps to form the clinic. It's been two months since our first meeting and things aren't moving. We need to begin to do the steps and the political theorizing necessary can go along with it. There was a concern, I, I think Robin Christensen really raised it uh, a lot and uh, that we should have our politics together before the clinic opened. And uh, what she meant by that, and it was a serious concern, is um, what we wanted to do with an alternative. Because once you organize an alternative, a lot of your energy goes into maintaining it. And so it takes you out of organizing, direct organizing. Robin, our problems are due to two things. One, no collective spirit. Two, no plan. Roxy, was really disappointed with last week's meeting. We were supposed to deal with each other politically and personally, and that didn't happen. We will have to do that before we can get the clinic together. There were many times that some of the intellectuals in the group would use words that the people in the working class didn't understand. And that's real politics. But we had to work through it, because if you're trying to get a clinic open, and you've got two months to go, and someone uses a word, and you have to take care of the business they're talking about. You go, what, what? What's the word? You know, what do you mean? Barb, things are happening, and a plan is coming together and emerging from the things that are happening. Patty, political hassling has to be a long process. Darsa, we need to find the tension points in the group. If you get involved in organizing alternative, whether it's New Pioneer Food Co-op or whether it's Emma Goldman Clinic for Women or whether it's, uh, what else, it's Stone Soup or, you know, something like this, um, you know, you, you, you end up uh, putting your energy in, or only into running an alternative business. You know, it's a petty bourgeois thing. And then we're getting salaries and then, um, you know, you want to, you, you have your own interests to, you know, to protect and, you um, um, it pulls you out of doing, you know, mass organizing. That was my concern, and that and that remains my concern. Darsa, the clinic is not a political organization, but more of a support service organization, a human thing. Barb and Patty, that is political. That is communist. Diane, doesn't understand what is being talked about. The idea of the general clinic is good, but we need to get the abortion self-help clinic together first, make money, then do other things. I think the fortunate thing and why we got things done was because we did have a goal and we had a timeline. If we hadn't had that timeline, we'd still be sitting talking politics, um, you know, with Marxists and Leninists and, you know, people trying to figure out who they are and what they are. Uh, there were many different perspectives. Roxy, we need to get an image to be able to present to all the different women who will be coming to us. A political rap will harm the group's overall image. Patty. Are we going to give every woman who comes to us a certain amount of support? Are we going to be responsible to every woman regardless of her class position? We need to deal with how we are going to react with each woman. Robin, those things are why we need to get together on our politics. I think sometime, it's my memory, and I, this could be off, but it seems to me it was sometime around May or June that uh, Roxy and Patty and I were out doing something or meeting somehow together having to do with this idea of the clinic and Roxy just said you know I've been thinking about this and I've got this money for my husband's death that I got from the insurance and it's um, you know it seemed like a lot of money at the time it was five thousand dollars as I recall and she just said you know I've I have a realtor friend and I I don't know if she knew of the house then or she knew she could find some place but she said you know why don't we just do it why don't we just you know, get off our butts and do it. And that seemed like a novel approach because all we were getting done at meetings were these endless discussions. Robin, to be a collective, we need support. To have support, we need to agree on personal levels. Leslie, there is something else happening here, a splinter group. Deb, it's not a splinter group. Some of us have been looking at houses and doing loans and doctors. Everything is ready to go if we just get it together. I recall Roxy and I looking for uh, houses and having a great deal of fun doing that um, because she was the one with money. And <laughs> so that made it, it's always a lot more fun when it's someone else's money. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, you know, looking at a facility and, and wanting it to be um, 
kind of have an atmosphere that was warm and um, comforting to people. We had to find something that was commercially zoned, uh, that had certain accessibility. Uh, the parking was good with that piece of property. We wanted the apartment to have the income to help support the clinic. I mean, it sounds crazy, but you know, every penny mattered back then. Our only income what came from going down to the student union or to speaking engagements and asking for 30 cents for a newsprint copy of Our Bodies, Our Sales because it hadn't been picked up by Simon & Schuster yet. And um, we would sell that and uh, we would also do, we were going out and doing self-help examinations and some lectures and things, but we're talking about very, very little money coming in that way. We didn't know what a clinic should look like. We knew what it, we didn't want it to look like. Um, and we looked at some real sort of awful places, but we finally settled on this one because it was, um, it seemed like uh, uh, physically it would really work. Diane, how can we work as a group when some people are off doing their own trip? Deb, there hasn't been time to get the group together. Roxy, the reason we are so untogether is because it takes a group approval to do everything. Jean-Viev, we don't need consensus of the group for everything. Blah, blah, blah. So we found 715 North Dodge, and it would have been an apartment uh, complex. It had three apartments, one on each floor, and it was owned by somebody who lived in some other state and who wasn't coming back and just wanted to get rid of all the furniture in it, too. So for $5,000, we had a down payment on a house. We had beds. We had chairs. We had, you know, whatever you would need. And um, Roxy put the money down, and we went back to the meeting, the next meeting, and we were so proud of ourselves that we had done this, and we announced it. And my recollection is, is that we got royally trashed for having done that, because the idea was that you were supposed to have your politics t together before we could go forward and actually, you know, get some you assets. You know, uh, no matter what kind of business or, or revolution you're running, you don't, you don't take it, you know, you don't take it upon yourselves. Uh, to go do, uh, make a decision like that, um, and uh, um, once they had done that, then we were put in the position of, of uh, ratifying it or canceling it, and um, that, at that point that forced the question, in a sense of, shall we do this now, shall we do the alternative, or shall we continue to uh, get our politics together, continue the you know, abortion referral service, the, you know, the um, self-help groups, the other kinds of organizing we had been doing. Um, so um, uh, that was good, and, and it, and it uh, you know, was part of how Emma developed, but uh, it was incorrect for, her, for them to do that. Um, and uh, of course they were chewed out about that. They should have been. June 4th, 1973, loans. The bank won't give us a loan. Patty may be able to get a loan from her parents. Ginny's parents will pay us to paint their house. Let's go ahead and get started in our Q&A. Um, I hope folks have enjoyed the film so far, and if you're interested in watching um, the latter parts, which I hope you are, they're all available on Media Burns website to stream for free. Um, so I'm gonna get us started with a couple of questions, um, but then I, I know folks in the audience probably have questions too. So you are welcome to raise your hand using the raise hand feature on Zoom if you'd like to speak out loud. Um, and you're also welcome to put questions in the chat. And after I ask a couple, I'll, I'll periodically check the chat and read those out. Um, but to get us started, Leanne, I wonder if you could take us back sort to sort of how you first came in contact with the Emma Goldman Clinic. I, I imagine your work on the film must have started around 30 years ago. So who was Leanne 30 years ago and how did you get interested in what the clinic was up to? Right. Yes, I was in graduate school um, getting my MFA in the uh, School of um, Art. And uh, we, I mean, you could not live in Iowa City in 1990, 91, 92, and not be aware of all of the politics around the Emma Goldman Clinic and the kind of almost dangerous elements. You know, Operation Rescue had just shut down Wichita, Kansas. I mean, shut that city down. And they put had their target on Emma Goldman Clinic next. I never even, you know, I was a graduate student. I'd go to student health. I never was a... Um, a, a a person who went to the Emma Goldman Clinic. I had I was not involved with them. I wasn't part of their collective. But when we heard that Operation Rescue was coming, 
we, uh, a group of the uh, female graduate students organized a rotating clock. So someone, a group of us was always there to do clinic defense, you know, all during the workday in between our classes and so on. And that's where I really um, felt, okay, this is an essential business. I may not have been someone who went to it or used it, but I, it was always there. And I, and you know how it is when we take something for granted, uh, that's when you realize how um, fragile something could be. Now, the Emma Goldman Clinic, even then, was pretty brilliant. They um, had a uh, uh, a program called um, Support a Protester, and they didn't mean us. They meant the Operation Rescue people that for every one of them that showed up, X amount of dollars were raised, and every so often they'd get up on top of the clinic with a bullhorn and say, you know, thank you, Operation Rescue, for showing up today. We just um, raised enough money for three women uh, who can't afford it to get a free abortion, those sorts of things. And it just kind of deflated them very quickly. The Iowa City Police had would not put up with their, um, you know, going on to property or go, they were going to the house, the personal houses of the doctors and things like that. So it was a huge political thing. And it, it made me focus on them in a way I had never focused. I just kind of always knew that they were there. And um, it was after that Operation Rescue, which I think was 91, um, uh, clinic defense. Um, we chased those suckers out, you know, three days. They were gone because they were getting nowhere and they were just raising money for us, you know, so that was okay. But that got, uh, Camille and I really got us thinking, uh, who are these people? How did they put this thing together? Because they were lay people. They were not medical people. Most of them were in law school. You know, they were, they were, you know, doing all different kinds of things, but um, they weren't doctors, you know, so they pulled something off that we thought was pretty amazing. And so once we started looking into it and realized that they were, we were coming up in their 20th anniversary, that's when we really focus I wrote grants to raise money to make the film and so on and we really shifted our focus creative focus to the Emma Goldman Clinic and um, as I said we're struck we're you know we were politicized into their um, circle by abortion but we were absolutely sparked in creativity by their politics it was so fascinating I had never you know because I was too young um, when they're doing this, I was, you know, in junior high. And so, the, you know, the idea of Maoist collectives and uh, criticism, self-criticism, and, you know, just all these different tools, um, self-help and so on, I had no idea. I had nothing. It, it was not in my, my constellation. But um, I was absolutely fan fascinated by how they pulled that off and then the trouble, the hard stuff. I mean, if you watch the full film, you'll see it goes um, in the first part one is kind of the founding part two is the functioning of it. And part three are the challenges of what was going on and brought it up to 1995. And we finished, you know, the film in 96. Um, so and at that point, that's when they finally decided they would have they'd stop they'd have a hierarchy. You know that was a breakthrough that and it was a long time coming, um, but it was something they realized uh, this consensus was very very difficult to maintain. You know and keep people involved. And I think this thread that you that you brought up earlier of you know just the impressiveness of what they were able to do and actually m mobilizing a Marxist politic and a feminist politic. Uh, there's this. Marxist feminist th thinker J.K. Gibson Graham, who argues that feminists are really good at making revolution, whereas Marxists like tend to wait for it. Um, <laughs> I've, I've got I've had the privilege of doing a lot of interviews with folks who started the Women's Health Center in West Virginia, which until it, abortion was outlawed this year with the last remaining abortion clinic and the casualness with which they were just like, yeah, row passed and we decided we would just make a clinic so we would have one. Um, yeah. No, but we don't wait. We're not waiting for somebody else. You know, we're the people we've been waiting for. Absolutely. And I think, you know, with with the piece on Operation Rescue, especially knowing what the environment is like around abortion now, like just to out myself, I was born in 1995. So this is really like, you know, I, I the privileges I've had thus far because of women like the folks at Emma Goldman Clinic and here in West Virginia. Um, but I imagine that there's some still like lingering safety risk. And I wonder how 
that might have factored into your access or were there people who weren't willing to be interviewed on camera um, or what was your process for getting access like for doing interviews? Yeah, um, it's it, in, uh, of course, you know, this was many years ago and but my memory is yeah, yeah. I mean, the the clinic had been bombed. It, you know, they had their share of threats and the doctors that would come and go because, um, uh, you know, they always needed to have a, or they at least they felt like they needed to have a, a an MD um, on the premises on abortion when whenever abortions were being done. Um, that yeah, it was a dangerous time. But I think there's a that's an interesting thing when I'm thinking back. We didn't hesitate to go and defend the clinic and link arms and walk women in and it didn't even dawn on us because you're young that you know your life is in danger you know and I honestly think you know that interviewing these women then 20 years later which we did in 93 many of them had said you know <laughs> if it was today I would never do it and that's why young people do these things because they can't believe it won't happen they they have a um, you know, it's, that's their gift that, you know, they will jump in and um, come up May. And the older we get, the more, I'm not saying conservative from a politics standpoint, but conservative in the way we see the world and, and uh, possibly shrink. And let's, let's be realistic after all, you know, and um, they don't care. They're about realism and all that. They just jumped in. Um, so to me, you know, that, it was a particular moment that perfect things came together with this group of women. And they, you know, Gail Sand was still the, she was the executive director at that time, you know, from a, a you know, a young, young person and a founder. It's 20 years later, she's running the joint, you know? And, and so it's, um, it is interesting, the, the commitment of those people. And, um, you know, and now I, and I'm actually, I'm very, I, I very much want to go back for their 50th and just see what the conversation is now because of the cultural and political, con you know, situation right now around abortion is very fraught. And um, I'm interested to see where, where are things going? Um, so one of the things that I kind of mentioned in the beginning that I wanted to ask about, and I will ask about now is, um, I think it's so interesting how this film focuses on group process. Uh, it makes me think about work like Lizzie Borden's film, um, Regrouping, which was recently restored, and Ariel Doherty, who's here, her film, Sweet Ban Bananas, which I think was recently restored, um, that really like it's worked to show what, what the day-to-day -day life of the women's movement was like, or certainly the exhaustion of being in meetings, but also um, the back and forth of trying to decide when's the time to do something or when do we have our politics together enough. Um, and certainly all of that conversation brings about conflict in this part of the film we watched. Um, I love the line, the person says like, of course they were chewed out for going and buying the house. They should have, um, yeah. Well, you notice she's outside. This is so indicative of her personality because she refused to be shot in the kitchen. We wanted, we wanted to stage things a certain way. And she's like, no, I want to be outside. I said, well, it's really difficult. We can't control the light. We can't control the sound, like too bad. If you want to interview me. <laughs> We're going outside. So that if that doesn't show you her personality, you you see it in the things she says as well. But you know, as we all know, it takes all different kinds of people um, when you when a group is trying to do something um, to get it done. And they they all are very unique, um, but they all brought something great to the table for sure. And I wonder, you know, because it, I think what this film does is it does a great job of showing the, all the different angles from which people are coming at these different like just decision points, not even necessarily problem, but just deciding what to do next. Right. And I wonder, you know, when you screen the film for the first time and the, you know, the people who participate see it, what was the response or, you know, did they, did people have beef with each other or, or yeah, how did people? No, I, I mean, you'll see it in the end. Um, uh, I, we, we, were, we were talking about this before everybody came on, on the Zoom and, and um, I was hoping that they would do the same thing. At the 20th anniversary, there were a number of activities going on during a, a long weekend, if I'm remembering right. And we were interviewing people constantly um, to try to capture as many people as we could with that opportunity. And then there was a big dinner of some sort of celebration and we set up a video booth. And that's where we got those little th thumbnail moments that are all in the, the credits. 
And there you see, you know, like the, the camaraderie of, you know, how many times we have to tell this woman that being late is a political, you know, thing and, you know, and, and uh, you know, just the kind of playfulness around them that I'm sure it wasn't playful at the time. Criticism, if anybody knows much about the technique of criticism, self-criticism, it's pretty brutal. Um, and uh, they, they were very lighthearted about it now, in retrospect, 20 years later. But I imagine it was very tough going a lot of those meetings and very heated, emotional, no doubt, lots of anger and, and emotions. And, and I imagine, especially, I think the dynamic that folks discussed in the beginning part of the film of some people coming into consciousness a little later than others, you know, it can be a pretty painful experience. Um, and then when you're doing criticism, self-criticism for the first time, that adds not another layer on top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a moment when Rox, it's, I think it's Roxy who says something about, you know, that people are using these words these intellectual words and some of the working class people don't know what you're talking about. And we have to stop it and say, what's the word? What does this mean before we can move on? Um, and because people are in different places, but um, we they've got to decide that they're all gonna go forward together, you know? Well, I'll, I'll pause here because we have a question in the chat from Ariel. Um, she asks, she says, you know, the standalone feminist clinics were great, but it allowed the medical profession to never accept its own medical responsibilities. Any thoughts on this um, today, given awful state decisions? Well, I think that we all know that, and, you know, especially for women's rights, you can't wait around for institutions to get on board because they, they have a vested interest in the status quo. And so I, I think that the, the feminist run clinics were absolutely crucial to even um, bring this into regular everyday discussion that this, that the existence of this and the need for it and so on. And in terms of the thoughts of what's today, my feeling is that um, it, 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 that's politics and it, in its state level politics, I get, you know, fundraising things all the time. Quick, we have to stop what's happening in West Virginia. And I'm like, no, the people of West Virginia have to stop what's happening in West Virginia. Um, because, because the women's feminist clinics are being shut down just as well as any kind of abortion that may have been available through other means, through hospitals and so on. And, um, uh, the, you know, yeah, make no, <laughs> you know, there's no question that it's, under siege, but um, the the women's the women's clinics are being shut down and planned parenthood and so on, just as well as abortions at you know established institutional hospitals and that that sort of thing. I agree. Go ahead, and I see Marianne has their hand up. Mm, not hearing something. And Marianne, I think you're muted, but whenever you would like, you can unmute and ask your question. <clears throat> yes, excuse me. Okay, um, I loved what I saw. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I lived in Iowa City for a while, although much earlier, I, it was in the 60s uh -huh. when I was there. So I had a good picture of everything. Um, I, did, I left uh, by 68. And so I'm just wondering in this film, it kind of uh, gives the impression so far that this was a, a one-off uh, kind of an institution. And I was wondering if you had dealt very much with the uh, whole women's movement and how that was uh, developed in Iowa City after I left, but I know that things were going on. So that, uh, so that the, uh, the clinic was really a part of a whole network. I wonder if you deal with that at all. Well, the problem, I think, especially any filmmakers, I welcome them to chime in because, you know, it's always you make decisions as it is. This is a feature length film only about Emma Goldman Clinic. If we got in the Women's Resource and, Resource and Action Center, I could have done a whole documentary on the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, just sure. about ourselves even. You know? Understood. So, yeah. So sometimes you've got to focus and what we tried to do was bring those moments in like um, Barb, uh, the, the, the gal that's sitting outside was saying, you know, it, whether it's this or it's that, and she rattled off a few other alternative businesses, which for a, a town of 50,000 people, Iowa City is not a booming metropolis. It is mm -hmm. surprising how many um, different um, 
kind of institutional business related money making opportunities were going on in the late 60s and early 70s that that were counterculture there's no doubt about it um but yeah we we you know we had to make decisions and as it yeah. was um making the decision to include every single woman we interviewed also took up a lot of screen time that you know you've got you know but we wanted you know we felt that that was important to the to the uh, the nature of the, the topic which mm -hmm. was that group you know so okay thank you you're welcome <laughs> And I think that whole ecosystem in Iowa City is so interesting. The reason I knew about the Emma Goldman Clinic is but because I had seen ads for it in different lesbian periodicals from that time, but also because of the Iowa City Women's Press, I think mm -hmm. the newsletter Ain't I a Woman, and like knowing this is all happening in Iowa, uh, in a place that's not as big, um, but has, you know, kind of a, a really powerful engine similar to what you would see in like bigger cities is so impressive to me. And also the Emma Goldman Clinic in Iowa, I think it really stands out on the landscape and <laughs> the kind of possibilities for, yeah, what could well, be there. And, and I think, you know, what's heartbreaking is someone who, I, I was born in Minnesota and raised in Iowa, and then um, for my career went to Massachusetts and then Philadelphia. Uh, that's the only reason I left the Midwest. Um, it's heartbreaking, actually, to see how far right Iowa has turned, because I remember very well I, my first job in 1981, I was um, a high school art teacher in Bettendorf, Iowa, and part of the Quad Cities. And um, the Iowa legislature passed a law that said all curriculum in public schools needed to be reviewed for non-sexist and inclusive um, language. And this was 1980, and they had five years to do it, and mm -hmm. Bettendorf hadn't done anything. So they're like in a panic. We have a year to go. What can we do? And I said, I'll do it. Well, I can organize this. So I organized and had had us review K through 12 curriculum to across the entire, um, you know, Bettendorf um, school district. But the 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 key element of that story is the Iowa legislature. <laughs> passed a law and mandated that all public schools would do this. It, it boggles the mind to see what they're doing now with banning yeah. books and so on, that um, the, po the politics of that state, are, it's shocking. And I think, you know, really this, you know, the span between 1980 and now is actually that long in the grand scheme of things. I have a friend who's a geologist who says human time is actually pretty small and everything from the perspective of a rock. But, you know, the, the, the slide has happened so quickly, but also it's not so far away that it, it is irreversible or that's my like utopian hope. Yes. Yeah, I agree with you. These there is an element of a swing and um, this backlash is particularly um, rough in many, <laughs> many different areas. Wow. So we have about five minutes left. So I, I like to ask you as we're kind of wrapping up and if folks have more questions, we can, you know, you can ask another one after this. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you're working on now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, my work has been, uh, it's a variety of different things, as you mentioned, um, in addition to like the Emma Goldman Clinic, which I think of it much more of a kind of an experimental structure and approach to vi visuals and so on compared to like um, Top Secret Rosie's um, The Female Computers of World War II. That was a feature documentary that is um, more of a like a PBS. Well, it is being dist still distributed by PBS. So it's a different kind of historical project, documentary project. Um, but one of the things that happened, uh, that thing, the, the film is such a long life. It's still in distribution. What the What is that, 13? years now. Um, but when I was touring it, uh, shortly after I, I released it, it, it came up over and over again, people would say, have you thought about, um, you know, making something along this line for kids? Because I would have, you know, I'm a computer person, and I wish I would have known these stories when I was a kid. And then the other one was, have you thought about doing something like a league of their own, like fictionalize a, a real women's story from World War II. And so that got me thinking and I did and end up developing an interactive children's book um, with videos and radio and so on called The Computer War Heals for like a 10 to 14 year old age group. Um, but I also now have, and I'm ready to pitch a fictionalized serial, you know, um, for Top Secret Rosie's with, um, you know, um, a, a dramatic 
multi episodic hopefully multi season uh, show that could follow these women and what they were doing. Uh, so yeah, I've got that that pilot script and the pitch and um, a pitch deck and so on ready to go. So uh, I'm I'm on sabbatical this year, which I'm very happy to be on. And um, one of my main goals is to uh, find a producing partners, you know, to to get that going and and get that uh, realized. Because I think I think it yes, the documentary work reaches a particular audience but it is not as broad as popular culture audiences. And so um, like Hidden Figures, I would love to have that kind of level of um, exposure to this historical story that many people don't know anything about. And I'm so excited to hear that. Certainly I, I'm, Hidden Figures comes to mind, the most recent iteration of A League of Their Own, especially too. Yeah. I think there's a real hunger for that kind of storytelling um, and yeah. you know, spread the word y'all. If, yeah. if you know people, uh, this is the time. <laughs> Yeah, let me know. <laughs> I'm definitely um, trying to find because because, you know, that's a dilemma. Again, if for any filmmakers in the group, uh, period pieces, they are expensive um, because of costuming and and vehicles and buildings and sets and so on. So it really would take a commitment. I mean, the A League of Their Own, I love the new series and I love the original movie. But the, the, I don't think the new series could have had a chance if the original movie hadn't been such a big hit. So, you know, it'd be, it's like proof of concept that becomes challenging. And what I'm thinking about doing is if I'm if I'm hearing as I pitch to producers and production companies, if I'm hearing kind of like we, we can't take a chance yet on something like this until, we, you know, you should produce the pilot or something, which that's a million dollar proposition I can't do. But I've already started outlining a podcast that I could do, that I could do, I could afford to do because I still own all the rights to all the media and music, sound, sound effects, et cetera. So I could do that. And that might be the proof of concept that could say, okay, this could be um, a viable visual, you know, Netflix series, let's say. Well, it's a powerful way in. And, you know, it's been so great talking with you about this film and getting to see your work. Um, and I, I, you know, thank you all to folks in the audience for coming. Um, thank you. And I think I'll hand it over to the media burn folks. I think we've got about 50 seconds left of our time. <laughs> Uh, yes, sorry, having a Zoom issue. Yes, thank you so much, Leanne and, and um, Caitlin. This was just a wonderful yeah. um, screening and discussion. Um, I definitely encourage you all to um, go ahead and watch the rest of the film later. Um, again, we'll send you a link to this recording and to the, to the film so you can share it with everyone you know. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for being here with us. We hope you'll join us again in the future. Um, and have a good night, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Media Burn, for all the work you do. The archive, I think your archive is absolutely crucial. And it's really fun to be able to do something like this. I'm glad you're doing this program. And yet another good thing that might have come out of COVID, <laughs> the fact that you're doing these things. <laughs> yes, for sure. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.